Indie Radio presents Talking Hell on Wheels, the show that takes a look at AMC's hit Western series. Join us every Saturday and Tuesday night as we take you on a journey as your favourite show comes to an end. Now, here are your hosts, Yardley and Kinte. Hello, and welcome to an all-new episode of Talking Hell on Wheels. I am one of your hosts, Kinte, all the way live from Los Angeles, California. And I'm here joined by my main man, co-host, the one and only, the militant one, Yardley. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Kinte. It's always good to be on with you, and I'm very excited about our guest tonight. Yes, yes. He's a, a gentleman that we've wanted to talk with for quite a while now, and we're so happy to finally have this opportunity to speak with him. And uh, we also love participation on this show, and there's many ways you can participate. One way is you can go onto our website, and that's IndieRadio.org. That's I-N-D-Y Radio.org. Uh, another way you can uh, participate is you can call in, and that number is 323-522-4601. Once again, that's 323-522-4601. And also, too, if you want to see us live via our video feed, you can go to blab.im or you can go to the the watch live video section on our website, IndieRadio.org. So many ways that you can join in on this conversation. And we're just so happy that uh, that we are finally able to uh, have this conversation. So uh, I want to first start off by uh, welcoming our guest, uh, D- David Von Aiken. How you doing? Doing good. All right. Oh, we had a little bit of uh, feedback from you uh, there. It's probably, um, I don't know if you have some headphones. Maybe that will stop the, uh, the feedback if it's possible. Yes. So while we're uh, waiting for uh, David to get the, uh, his uh, headphones on, um, I just want to first say that... Uh, we have so much to talk about with this final episode. Um, you know, uh, it's one of those things that we've been talking about now since that uh, since they announced that the final episode was, I mean, the final season was coming. And uh, I'm really interested because me and you haven't talked yet about what we thought about the final episode. So I'm really interested to, to hear what your thoughts are, uh, Yardley. But we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, how you doing, David? I'm doing great. Uh, I thought, yeah, I'm getting a double feedback here too. Uh oh. Now it's working. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. You can still hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you just fine. Uh, are you getting uh, double feedback, uh, Yardley? Uh, I'm not. Not on my end. Uh-oh. Okay. I'm just hearing myself twice. Oh, okay. Um, bottom line is, uh, I thought it was. I thought it was a great send off for Edson, for Cullen. Uh, you know, you take him to the edge. Of the continents and let them go. Yeah. After all we went through in uh, five slash six seasons, I thought that was a fitting way to let them go into the horizon. Now, oh, go ahead, Yardley. I'm sorry. No, I was saying I actually have to agree. Um, I managed to have an opportunity to watch the episode a couple of times. We'll definitely talk about this um, with David, but there were so many callbacks uh, to the pilot that I'm very excited to talk about tonight. Well, I I thought we would reward people who had uh, watched the whole series. And from the the church in the way he's in the confessional to walking through the hell. Uh, right up until the end, uh, there was a lot of visual similarities uh, by design to the first episode. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, it was definitely something that 
if you were a Hell on Wheels fan from the beginning, it definitely brought a smile to your face because when we saw Cullen enter that church and um, look up at the, the Jesus and go, hmm, you know, a huge smile came over my face. And then I actually went back and I watched the pilot. And uh, I don't know. It's just one of those things where you kind of feel like everything went full circle. But then at the same time, it hits you that, you know what, uh, this thing is over. So uh, I don't know if I should be sad or take another shot of whiskey. <laughs> I think a lot of us, you know, we got together, several people of us in the same room to watch it tonight, uh, Anson and some of the producers. And it really brings back memories. It's a lot of hard work being outside so much and so often to rain, snow, and ice, and everything you can think of. Uh, but it was one of those shows that you think it doesn't come around that often. And uh, when he stepped into the church, we couldn't find that Jesus anymore. That crucifix had been wrecked when we went back to rent, rent, to rent it again. And so I wound up using the same shot from the pilot because it was a clean POV. So we just took it from the pilot. He looks up, he sees exactly the same thing from the same uh, episode of number one. Now, for those who may not know, uh, David was the director on the pilot as well as the finale. And um, you directed a lot of the premieres, too, I believe, season two and three, right? Right. I, I directed on season one, uh, several season two, and the first episode of season three. And, you know, what's so cool, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, the director of a pilot plays a huge part in really setting up the look and feel of uh, of a TV show when you when you agree with that oh yeah and in this in this one uh, it was uh, the pilot was written by uh, Tony and Joe Gaden who uh, you know the creators of the show and after some changes was picked up by John Worth who took over in the final three years of the show and, uh, you know, both guys, both, both camps did a, a great job keeping Cullen alive and not so well. But in terms of the pilot, we decided to make it a throwback to the 70s, kind of gritty westerns where it's a lot of behavioral uh, elements of the storytelling, not necessarily talky. In fact, we hate it. Right. Yeah. Um one thing, and I, I want to go back to the pilot, uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll get back to uh, the finale. But, um, you know, I, I can only imagine you're a veteran, been in this business for quite a long time. So um, if you're taking on a pilot, uh, you know, you don't really know what, how it's going to turn out. If you could ever if you could ever envision that this show would have went on for six years, five seasons and all of it, it was able to accomplish. I mean, could you see that at all when you took it over in the, uh, the you know, filming the pilot? And did you did you see that this show had that kind of staying power? I, I did. I mean, you only hope that a show could have such strong legs and keep people interested uh, overseas. It. But the fact that a, a guy who is rooted in history, so Anson's a playing a, a fictional character, of course, but surrounded by people, uh, Thomas Durant, uh, Carlos Huntington, you know, and, and, and lots of others in the show who were real. And you, you'd hope that when you're riding that wave of, uh, you know, historical fiction, you can keep adding to it enough that people will always find it interesting. And I find that, that the character that Anson created out of... Uh, uh, in the first episode, even was something that was quiet, dangerous, damaged. You know, get all the tenets of something that, that you can really kind of vest yourself in year over year. Um, and something else along the lines, um, it, it only seems fitting that you were you would be the person that would close things out. Um, how far ahead did you know that they wanted you? Um, to close this, the series out the way that you started it, um, did you have a lot of notice, or was this something that was always um, in the works for quite a while? I think in TV, it's never in the works for, you know, too, too long. But Worth and Jeremy Gold, two of the producers on the show, called me and asked me if I, would be, if I could be available to finish it out. And since I hadn't worked on the last couple of seasons, I was busy in L.A., 
stuff, uh, I thought that'd be great. And, and it was just such a terrific cast and terrific crew, terrific writers. It was a really fun group that managed to more or less stay intact over the five seasons. Um, you know what? That's real awesome. And, and Kente had brought this up. You know, earlier in the show, you know, you've had a lot of opportunity to um, to open up uh, different seasons of the show. And every time that you opened up a season, Cullen Bohannon um, had kind of advanced, you know, to a certain stage in his character. Um, I think Big Bad Wolf, which was what season was that season three? Three. Oh, can't they? Yes. yes, and you know, it just seems like every stage that your hands are in, he's always transforming as a character. And it must have been so cool at the end of the day to kind of see everything come that, full circle. That first day of season three, episode one, might have been one of my favorite days of shooting. I mean, we lucked out, we showed up in Calgary, it was brown and dry, and it was, I think, March or something, so we had gone up there to get it snowy. And that night it snowed three and a half feet. Mm. And when we got to the tent, so deep, <clears throat> that only the cameraman, Anson and myself, could make it into the the woods in the areas near the river. So pure luck that we got amazing snow and Anson that had him dive into it, I had him take his clothes off and all around how he saw that made it to the final time. There was a there's an enormous amount of amazing footage we shot that day. Although the wolves, oddly enough, <clears throat> were big pussies and wouldn't come out of their cage. <laughs> <laughs> we could oh, not man. get wolves to attack Anson so I gave him that Harder to care for me. A couple of shots of a wolf running by. It's always to coax this big bad wolf to do. And the, I, I took a dummy stuffed wolf and I said, "You know, now's the chance to earn the keep." And said, wrestle with the wolf in the snow, <laughs> threw the dummy at him. <laughs> oh and man! Ultimately, it worked. But one of those moments where you've got the sun setting and you're about to run down for a degree, and uh, you have to get the shot. And Anson just stepped up and he didn't. Uh, much. He just did it and, and made it work. And at the end of the day, that was one of the most beautiful, uh, I'd say, openings I've ever been involved with. Now, um, at what, you know, I wonder, um, going back to the pilot, uh, at what point of the process does the uh, pilot director come on the scene? Uh, as, uh, you know, is it like late into the process before they're about to no, start? No, I mean, it's early. If you do it right, Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get hired to just come and fix things, but the script had been written. It was being retweaked and rewritten by the Gaby brothers. Uh, where we were shooting was still up in the air. Style of shooting was still up in the air. Uh, pretty much all choices had yet to be made. Casting was still up in the air. We, we, we found Anson on script looking at 60 some odd people for the role. Mm -hmm. Common walked in to casting and with no uh, dialogue he just picked up a fake hammer took off his shirt and started hammering his bike a big spike into the ground I thought done he's our guy oh oh that's great so it was myself Jeremy Gold and the Game Brothers who sat in for uh, I would say uh, How many people um, did you guys go through for the character of Durant? It almost seems like Colomini was like a no-brainer, but um, were there any, how many other choices did you guys uh, go through for him? There was a lot of people who were interested. It was sort of like oh, it's an offer-only situation. Uh, he had a big career before he met us on the wheels, and uh, we all liked it. You know, he's able to pontificate, but still have an edge to him that's kind of yeah. And that's what we thought Thomas Durant needed to be. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was easier to cast. We had a short list, and when we got to him, he was, he was available, and, and, and uh, once he read it, I think he was in, as I recall. You know what, that's awesome. And seeing as we have... Um you know, we're talking about Colin, and I'm going to kick it over to you in a second, um, Kente. Uh, another parallel 
um, that was kind of exhibited in the um, series finale was, you know, first we had uh, Bohannon's introduction to the church and we got that. But then, you know, you guys kind of segued into uh, into Durant. And, you know, he made a big speech trying to recruit everybody to get on the railroad in the pilot right after that um, epic scene when we were introduced to Colin Bohannon. And in the finale, um, he's basically, you know, on trial. And some of the parallels between what happened was, uh, in the pilot, he was saying that he would be looked at, you know, as a caitiff, pretty much a scapegoat. And that's exactly what happens uh, at the end of the series. You know, all of the work is done, and everybody's making him the scapegoat. But um, I think only Colin can pull off those, uh, those long dog drives. Oh, yeah. I think in the in the um, finale court kind of uh, sequence uh, in front of the Senate hearing, you have Bohannon say uh, the, the transcontinental railroad could not have been built without Tom Durant. That's his mantra, and that kind of speaks to exactly uh, the whole show. He, he, there's the loyalty there that wasn't around to begin with, but was earned. Yeah. And at the end, he's not gonna he's not gonna sell out. Yeah, I wouldn't call him his friend, but at least someone who you can respect. Uh, absolutely. So I guess at the end of the day, Durant ended up being the zebra. That's exactly right. <laughs> right now, and in um, real life, Durant, who made eighteen seventy nine, I want to say he made five million dollars in one day in the New York Stock Exchange. By shorting various companies, he was in the process of destroying. Uh, died, I believe it was in Vermont, a pauper by himself in some unheated cabin. Wow, wow. Um, now, uh, where did, now did you guys shoot the the scenes in DC? Uh, did you shoot it in uh, Calgary? We shot, except for that sailboat sequence in the finale, we shot the, every other scene in Calgary. Oh, okay. And so we, we found Calgary's not known for preservation of architecture. Anything old is pretty much summarily destroyed and put up new kind of oldest type buildings. We found an old church that no one had taken down, and we, uh, we kind of CG'd the rest. Yeah, you did a great job because it, it looked real legit. You know, like I was like, wow, this. Looks really good, yeah. So, kudos to that. I mean, um, those scenes were really good. And I like the I, I like the idea of Custer and Bohannon shooting guns, and in the distance is uh, the Capitol. Yeah. They're out of the swamp in Northern Virginia. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, that that was really cool. Great casting too, by the way. Of Custer, that guy was uh, the actor was did a fantastic. Job. I mean, to come in on the last episode of a, such a great show, and then. You almost wanted to see more of that character. It was like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, you're going to tease us with this great Until character. Eight months until he gets shot up with the arrows. I know, right? <laughs> Maybe they should do a, a spinoff. We should do a spinoff. But of, it was uh, fun. I think it was fun. Great actor. Uh, fun for the writers to let another historical figure creep in. Yeah. Someone yeah. who you, most people know his eyes, yet he's still got that. And I love some of the dialogue that Tom Brady um, and Jamie O'Brien slipped in for his character on the fact that he says ship out, kill some engines and ride back to Washington hero, which was exactly what he wanted to do. Uh, I think it was before the battle of little bighorn, right? And he, but that's, that's what he was trying to convince Bohannon to do. Mm. So you get the feeling if Bohannon, said, uh, yes, he may have been involved with a little bighorn, and that would have been the end of him. Right. Now, now there was a lot of influences I took from some uh, in the pilot and, and certainly in the first couple of seasons in storytelling. Uh, a little big man, interesting uh, film that was oddly enough shot by about 20 miles shot the pilot in 19, I think it was 74. Uh, with Dustin Hoffman and uh, some of those early Clint movies where he took over from Leone directing I Play Drifter, etc. Some of those ones where there's not a lot of talk. That's what we were going for. 
Yeah, you can feel it too. It had that feel. You, the the good thing about the the last episode was it didn't feel like any other Hell on Wheels episode, and it felt like a callback too, though. You know, it had like both of that going for it. It felt different, and it felt like, and you can feel the the callback to the pilot and all of that kind of stuff. So you you did a, a really good job. It, it it gave us. I thought it was a very fitting in to uh, such a great show, and I liked how. The very end, like we see him going back to China or going to China, but I liked how it ended there. Like we, I don't think we needed any more than what we got. I thought it was perfect. I thought you guys did a uh, did a really good job uh, in that as well. Um, I want to circle back to um, I want I want to circle back to uh, the. Uh, I was send- on the fence about sending him to China, mm-hmm. but when I saw the final cut. I thought it was a good choice. I thought the alternate could have been letting him just get to the top edge, look at the water, and that's the end of it. He's made it into the edge of the continent far than any other character in a Western has ever made it. There's no place else to go. You, that's you, the end. You know what I thought was going to happen? But I just, you know what I thought was going to happen, though? Seriously? I thought he was going to be looking at the, the water and then remember, he had pissed off the uh, the Chinese bosses, or potentially. I thought somebody was going to come from the back and shoot, you know, like get him, like in the end or something like that. Like he was going to have his uh, Carlitos Way moment or something. That would have been a surprise ending. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that would actually would have been kind of sweet. Uh, now that I think about it, but you know how many people would have like thrown their remotes at the TV? And <laughs> I, I know. I love it though. <laughs> it's like eh? I think early on we thought, unless he somehow did not make it out of this. Archie's a pretty dark character. Yeah. And so I think, um, at least in the gate, really, at some point, he's going to go you know, by the knife, die by the knife type thing. Mm-hmm. As the seasons yes. rolled out, rightly so, I think he deserved to lose. Yeah, we always thought, me and me and uh, Yardley always thought it was going to end bad for him. I th- we always thought that he was going to eventually. Uh, die, but you know, like I said, it it worked though. It really worked the way that it ended. That you know, there's no disappointment, anything. Because you know, a lot of great shows have terrible finales. I'm talking about like all time great shows have terrible finales, and you guys really did an excellent job of not falling into maybe some of the traps that other shows uh, have done and stuff like that. Uh, you know, and I thought that was pr- pretty. I thought it was pretty excellent because you know, how do you how do you close off a show that's been on for like six years? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's tougher than I think people realize. I think that it's uh, it's you're right. It's difficult to do it. It's difficult to do it to please an audience, to please yourself, and more importantly, to please the, the character. Really, it's like what does the character deserve? If you think of it like that, yeah. Well, you, you know, you have a choice. You kill him, let him live. Certainly the murderer who he is at first deserves probably to die, but he goes through some serious penance. He suffers. Uh, and at the end of it, perhaps he deserves a second chance. I always like Westerns, good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of those very clean 70s Westerns that, have a simple theme, but the characters did after the movie ended. Where yeah. Did on? Where did the adventures go on to? I kind of like those open-ended, you know, you see Clint right off into the sunset on half a dozen of those, you know, and where does he go in the next day? Same thing for, uh, same thing for, for Colin Bohannon. At the end of it, he, you don't know where he's going to go. He could wind up going back to this, States, or he could be totally in China. Yeah. Well, the the way that y'all did things, I don't think that you really could have failed. Um, as Kente had mentioned, we had been predicting that uh, he would die in the end. And what really made me think that um, you were going to go there was when he went in the church, and then he peels off that piece of wood, and you see the bullet hole, and then you kind of feel like that's kind of foreshadowing. He sees the bullet hole. He kind of feels like he's gotten that release. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, he's about to die. 
Like I, I, I just knew he was going to die, and I was just kind of sitting back watching Twitter and, and, and Facebook because I knew it was going to explode if he got killed. But um, <laughs> you guys actually, I think you guys did the right thing, but I don't think that you would have lost in any direction that you would have, you know, if you had gone the opposite direction. Well, you know what he what it allowed, uh, David. Well, it's good to hear as you guys watch the whole. A lot of reaction. I've been getting. Oops. See, I'm uh, working on a show now which has a crew of 175, and I got approached by half a dozen people the next day. You know, and they'd all watched every episode. Oh wow! Okay. Um, all right, we have a couple of questions from the chat room. Uh, Alan wants to know uh, what do you look for when you direct a show or any project. Uh, what is your thought process on uh, a project? I, I think he means uh, picking a project to work on. You know, picking a project, this uh, was the first pilot I ever directed. And I've, got, yeah, I've gone on to kind of stay with mostly these behavioral stories. I like stories that can be told with little talk. A few years before making Helen Wheels, I wrote and directed a, a feature that oddly enough uh, was a western that crossed the same period of time uh, that actually crossed there was a transcontinental railroad in it called Seraphim Fall and that was a you know, Mies and Pierce Brosnan two guys going at each other and trying to you know it's a revenge kind of violence begets violence story that had some things that are very similar to Helen Wheels you know, in terms of redemption, how do you deserve it? But if you're looking at projects, you know, contemporary or, or uh, uh, period, I just look for something that's curious to me. Is there, is there a character that, that that makes me think that I can relate to personally, but more importantly, that he can grow and I can see or she can grow and be interested in what their choices are year after year? You know, you don't want, I think in TV, the big fear is always that you get stuck with something that you run out of ideas. And I think it's pretty easy to cherry pick shows that have done that. Okay. Uh, Toshida wants to know, is there a project that you have been uh, really wanting to produce and what is your dream project? You know, this was about as close to a dream project as you can get. You make a feature a few years later the producer, German Golf called me up and he said, I saw this movie, it'd be, it'd be perfect for this idea we've got. And it's in a continuation of a story like that. You know, it's very simple, uh, behavioral, and, uh, you know, it's a time when people didn't chit-chat. They just get to the point. And a lot of times the point is at the end of a 45. And so that, at that point, that was a dream project. Now, you know, I'm working on I'm, I'm producing and directing a show called Code Black on CBS right now. Interestingly, it's a hospital show. It's one big room, yet it's surprisingly behavioral. And it's, it, it, again, it's, it's characters that you feel uh, can grow and, and they surprise you. So you're always curious about what they're going to do. And so that's, in, that's in also a very interesting show. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm producing a show that uh, uh, look, we're looking to set up a show it's, it's actually been purchased and hopefully we'll, you'll see it on the air That's you know, it's, it's as out there as anything that I've ever heard of uh, written by the Game Brothers again about a guy who comes home one day and feels you know, he may or may not be going crazy it's, it's called uh, well we don't have a title for it right now oh interesting I also see that you um, have some things coming up uh, something you know that's definitely in my age bracket, and I don't. I think it's self-explanatory, you know, for those of us who are old enough to remember uh, MacGyver. Uh, how did you get up on that? James Wan too. MacGyver is, I think, you know, it's a reboot of the '80s, and uh, it's sort of being reconfigured a number of ways right now. And you'll see it CBS in the fall, and it's trying to find a way. To contemporize that cheesy mullet wearing dude who became a verb and is popular in like 200 countries still uh, with today's audience. Why, is he pop why did that last? Of all the 80s 
why are people excited to see this one? And I think it's because it's it's nice to know he's out there because he's he's not a he may be a like a, a dummy in some ways and get himself in trouble, yeah. but he's going to get himself out of trouble. Oh you want to you want to hear I'm something really funny, David? You want to hear something funny, David? Uh, when I was getting ready for this uh, interview, um, I looked at your IMDb, and the first thing I saw was MacGyver. I'm like, dang, this guy go way back. And then I looked, I was like, oh, <laughs> 2016. Hopefully, not that far back. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh man, he started long. And then I looked at the date. I was like, oh shoot, okay, this is a new one. <laughs> so, so it threw me off a little bit. <laughs> It threw me off a little bit. So, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, how about, uh, we're going to ask you to refresh your browser real quick, um, and that that should clear up the uh, technical difficulty, uh, David. So, just hit the uh, refresh button. And uh, while we, d- yeah, the top of your browser. So, that, that should... Uh, that should do that. All right. So uh, while we're waiting for David to come back in, um, you know, there's a couple of other programs I want to ask him about that he's uh, worked on um, over the years. Uh oh. Uh oh. We're getting some feedback. Let me see. Maybe that's me. All right, sorry about that. A little technical difficulty. All right, can you hear me, uh, Yardley? Yeah, I can hear you fine. He, he just said he's going to refresh his browser again. I don't know if it was the fact that he took his um, his earbuds out or not. but uh, Probably, More than likely, yeah. All right, so while we're waiting for uh, David to come back, though, like I said, there, there's some other programs that, uh, that he's worked on that I want to definitely ask him about. Uh, let's see. All right, he's coming back. And just to let people know, to remind people that you are listening to Talking Hell on Wheels, we are with uh, TV director uh, and producer David Von Aiken, who uh, directed the series finale and the series premiere of the show Hell on Wheels. Um, Yeah, I think you you need to have your your headphones. That's what uh, is giving the feedback. But uh, so... And, of course, if you guys want to call in, you can do so. The number is 323-522-4601. Once again, that number is 323-522-4601. And, of course, if you want to see us live, you want to see our mugs live video, you can go to blab.im and you can uh, you can do that as well. And we are back here with uh, director and producer uh, David Von Aiken. How are you doing, sir? Good. Very well. Now, I... C- Still getting that drip, double echo. Really? Okay, because uh, I uh, I don't think. Do you guys hear the echo in the audience? Yeah, I don't hear any. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why you get it. Uh, I don't. Uh, we All right, don't. We'll, we'll deal. Okay, so now I can't uh, I can't bring you on the show without asking you about a, a show that you uh, directed, uh, Californication. I really enjoyed that show. What was that like working on that show? That was a, a, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to read great scripts and have really fun to uh, crew make it, and did that, I don't know, for seven or eight seasons. And I would say that there wasn't a single day that wasn't fun on that set. I can only imagine. I mean, you had such a great cast and a great material. Um, you Were you on from the beginning? <coughs> Yeah, I think I did it every season except one when I was away <clears throat> doing the pilot of Helen Wheels. Other than that, I, I was uh, I did all seven or eight seasons, but it was all. All right, uh, yeah, great, great show, and um, I also yeah, that, that show either had, that had an audience of people who either loved it or hated it. Most people I found really could relate to Hank Moody in some street. You know, he was. In the same way that Colin Moran was flawed, uh, bachelor as it were, by his family being killed and having bills, of course. But he had a forty-five, and, and uh, Dave had a pen. 
but they both get in trouble in their own way. So it had this like this similar through line of a guy who, on one level, is very hard to relate to, and on another level, you totally empathize with him. He could have been his great 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 granddad. <laughs> <laughs> They they had a lot of similarities, as you were saying. Yes, for sure. They would have definitely enjoyed drinking together if they were in the same space. So that is true. <laughs> That's for Brown sure. Brown liquor. Yes, and um, also too, we had before you came in. Um, uh, Alan in the chat room was asking about the uh, Tut series. Uh, what was that like working on that? That was terrific. That was a uh, TV's first spray in. A scripted uh, drama. They mostly do reality shows, and they got this guy Michael Vickerman, the writer, to come up with a six-hour run series on the life of where we fill in the blanks from his history on King Tut, how he defended uh, his country, and how he dealt with you know various people trying to. Like, we know he died when he was 19, so it was, uh, it was kind of a, a built-in tragic show. But it was that was a very, very big undertaking that we shot for five months in Africa. Oh, wow. um, I can only imagine, because uh, I remember, if I remember correctly, that show did very well on television, right? That show did well for Spike. Right. And Joe Gibb playing Tut. Sibylla Dean playing his queen and, and, and Sir Ben Kingsley playing the uh, manipulating bad guy, the Grand Vizier. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did it old school, you know, sort of David Lean, Lawrence of Arabia style, since they shot the same place in Morocco. We were shooting, I figured we could do it. Uh, we should not make it into a CG fest wherever possible. You know, upwards of 800 background people dressed as warriors, and uh, we did use CGI where necessary because it's, of course, a very old story. You can't, you know, you have to make everything up for 3000 BC. But we built the sets fully. We dressed the people in stuff that was made. Uh, Carlo Pajoli, our uh, wardrobe designer, just he, he fabricated everything on site in Africa. So it was kind of authentic. Funny because you can be with a three thousand year old story, <laughs> right? Wow, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, good stuff. It's fun if you haven't seen it. It's a pretty big. You know something that's kind of interesting, and uh, uh, I'm gonna uh, end it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, hello. And at the end, is, you know, that uh, doesn't that doesn't make it out of the story. Now, um, now before we say goodbye, I want to. Um, now you talked. We talked about the MacGyver piece that's coming up, and potentially something uh, with the Gatons. Are there any other programs that we should be on the lookout for, or any uh, uh, movie David, project? Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear I me? I actually can't. Hold up one second. Let me refresh. Okay. Uh, so, um, are there any other movie projects or? There's TV? something that you should be on the lookout for. Mm -hmm. It all works out right. You may see Ants and Mounts in another uh, show that deals with the Dominican Republic and baseball. And a uh, uh, fallen from grace baseball player and a local drug dealer being forced to into a very strange partnership. Wow, that sounds really good. That sounds hey, like David, a, uh, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me, uh, Yardley? Yeah, I can hear both of you guys. Okay. That sounds really good, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just couldn't for a second, so I refresh. It's called it's called the Republic. The Republic. Okay. And now, uh, is there a network attached to it yet? Kind of. We'll oh, see. Okay. All right. Uh, that sounds really good. I, man, I'm gonna keep definitely keep on the lookout for that. That that sounds really cool, uh, Yardley. Uh, but he was just saying a, another potential Anson Mount uh, TV series. <laughs> Um, and it sounded really good too. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, you, now you yeah, want to... that works. It's oh, going to okay. be very, very good. Oh wow. Uh, now, now you wanted to say something, uh, Yardley. Go ahead. Yardley. 
Okay. He's having so he's having Yeah, a, I'm just getting a little um Yeah. I, I can't. Mm-hmm. All right, so yeah, he was having technical technical difficulties. Uh, but um, so uh, how can people get you in social media? And do you have a website potential uh, f- for people to look and see what you have coming out? Uh oh. All right, we're having uh, technical difficulties. Waiting for our guests and co-hosts to come back in. Sorry about that. Um, of course, go to IndieRadio.org. That's I-N-D-Y Radio.org uh, and to get more information about our shows. Um, just waiting for David as well as Yardley to come back in. Um, all right. Hey, Yardley. Hey. Uh, yeah, things got really laggy, so uh, apologies. I don't know what's up. Yeah, there we go. All right. There we go. Yeah, much better. Um, so how, how can people get you in social media and do you have a website? I, I do have a website, and uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a part of my reconstruction at this moment. It's going to be coming up soon, but what's my thing? What's my thing? Yeah, yeah uh, you can search me on Twitter. I'm on both. All right. Not frequently. It's really exciting, but right now I'm not spending 12 hours a day producing the direct code back. All right. So uh, definitely we're going to check that out. And we're going to keep our lookout for MacGyver coming this fall. That sounds really interesting uh, growing up a MacGyver fan. And uh, also, Yardley, how can people get you in social media? Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Militant underscore Marker. You can follow me at Kente F. And, of course, go to uh, our website, IndieRadio.org. You have a great rest of your week, everybody. <laughs>